Leviathan is one of the most mysterious figures in the Bible. This creature is described in several critical passages of scripture and in end times Bible prophecy. But just what or who is this mysterious creature that lies in the sea that's described in the Bible? And what role does Leviathan play in the end times? Well, you're going to find that out and much, much more. Uh, greetings. Thank you for watching tonight on Thursday Night Theology. I am, of course, your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim, the comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6, the days of Noah. Why do we have the global flood, the giants? Where did Goliath come from? Why were there wars in Canaan for extermination? It's all answered in this biblical study, Judgment of the Nephilim, that goes through the ultimate prophecy of the Messiah in the book of Genesis, taking us to the fulfillment of that and why the devil tried to prevent our salvation and redemption and God's battle and plan to rescue and redeem us through the seed of the woman, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah. I'm also the author of The Final Nephilim, the sequel to Judgment of the Nephilim that goes from Genesis to Revelation and goes right to the final battle between Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the other seed of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Antichrist. It gets into Armageddon, end time Bible prophecy, the complex prophecies of Revelation, the UFO phenomenon, the return of the fallen angels, and much, much more. And so much more to come on that. But the purpose of tonight, of course, Thursday Night Theology, if it's your first time watching, and again, greetings wherever you are in the world. The purpose of this show is for me to work for you. This is the show where I take questions during the week from subscribers, from listeners on my social media, and apply my research to the best of my ability to try and answer the tough questions in the Bible. And we have some great questions tonight. We're going to get into Leviathan. And this is a special episode because I'm going to introduce a very special guest. I'm so excited to have my first guest on Thursday Night Theology. He is uh, the host of the Bible Mysteries podcast. He also has a website, Unlock the Bible Now. And uh really is just super passionate about the scripture. And I think it does cover some really, really exciting topics on the Bible, on Bible prophecy and the supernatural, and really has an eye towards the return of our Savior. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to Thursday Night Theology, Scott Mitchell. Hey, Ryan, thank you. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for being my first guest on my show. And of course, for anyone who's watching live, um, uh, I, I had to get this going early before, before I forget it. I always want to remind people, if you have questions, I will, you know, we're going to do some questions tonight together, me and Scott together. But also, if you have questions, we're going to do a very special overtime where Scott and I are both going to answer questions. So to put them in the chat and we will hopefully get to a number of them. I have a feeling we will and have some great discussion tonight. So uh, I hope so. Scott, so for uh, for the audience, for my audience here, the Thursday Night Theology audience, why don't you just share a little about yourself and what led you to get into really the ministry? But obviously it's a podcast and a website, but I, I see what we do, the work we do as ministry. What yeah. led you to, to it now? You bet. Well, first of all, Ryan, it's an honor to be here. And I, I really <laughs> just made aware that I'm your first guest on the show. So uh, even more of a special thing for me. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Ryan, you've, uh, you are um, definitely, we desire to cut you back on our podcast as soon as possible to, to interview you some more about the judgment of the Nephilim or the final Nephilim. Uh, but um, what got me started was uh, back when I was a teenager, I started understanding uh, how to study the Bible um, through some Bible classes locally. And, you know, I, um, I did not grow up in a religious home at all. And so um, I, I feel like at a young age, there was a struggle with me to uh, I could have gone in any direction. The, the devil was trying to distract me through something. And uh, and then I think the Lord was was trying to get my attention as well. And uh, fortunately, the Lord showed me some truth that helped me uh, alleviate some of the concerns that I had. And it was one of the first um, episodes or, or Bible studies I ever attended was um, about demonology. And I used to have recurring nightmares as a kid. So that they, they stopped when I began to realize who Satan really was. It wasn't the Hollywood 
picture of him. You know, it was the, sure. what the scripture said about him. So that began just a lifelong quest of me wanting to search out the scriptures. And I've been teaching Bible classes and uh, a pastor at a church for over 16 years, uh, teaching Bible classes longer than that. And um, finally, uh, right around 2019, we decided to start Bible Mysteries podcast, uh, living in a small town in Texas uh, with uh, not a large assembly as many Bible churches are not particularly large congregations. Uh, I just felt like I wasn't reaching people uh, on a day-to-day basis uh, that I wanted to reach. And I could see around me, it seems like these times are telling me something, you know, as, as many of your listeners are probably aware, the times seem to be pointing to uh, we're approaching the last days. So I needed some vehicle. And I think the Lord put on my heart to start a podcast and I'd been thinking and praying about it. I didn't know how to, to overcome the technical challenge of it. And finally, some technology changed to where I felt like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> this is not too hard. So we started Bible Mysteries. Uh, the Lord gave, gave me this wonderful host and Zena, uh, my co-host, and uh, of course, my wife, Sandy, who's my producer. So we started putting this message out and uh, uh, I thought I would pattern it somewhat after um, I, I used to be a fan of the Art Bell show. Back in the days when Coast to Coast was hosted by Art Bell, I would listen occasionally late at night if I was traveling or something uh, on still on the road in the middle of the night. And um, I thought that would be a good premise to show the the mysterious things in the Bible, uh, but tie it back into the truth instead of just talking about ghosts and Bigfoots and something like that, you know. And so it it, it turned out to be immensely popular. We're over 66,000 subscribers in just a short time. And a lot of the credit for that is having had you <laughs> the, uh, to, to talk about your books. Some of our most popular uh, uh, episodes are about the Nephilim. And, and so uh, when, I, when a friend of mine, a dear brother, shared with me your book, I was like, where is this guy? <laughs> I need to meet him. <laughs> so thankfully, the Lord opened that door for us to meet. And I'm, I've been grateful ever since. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. And uh <laughs> Since you won't say it, I will say that the content, and this is really another reason why, in addition to the fact that, I, you know, I really enjoy getting to know you. You're one of the few people I've, I've done an interview with. I got to do an interview in person, um, yeah. which was great. And um, but also, I just think the content you're doing is really, uh, you know, really cutting edge. You know, just looking at some of the topics. First of all, you've put out a lot of content very consistently in the last two years. And, you know, the world that was the Nephilim. Uh, Obviously, topics on the Antichrist, Gog, Magog, you're really hitting on lots of really, I think, important, important topics in scriptures and really taking on the tough passages. So I, I just respect mm. it. And I, I just think you're doing an excellent job. And, I, I, you know, I'm Praise honored. And also, you know, you mentioned your co-host, Zena. I think it's great, too, that you have someone who is from the younger generation who yeah. brings a different perspective of someone who may not be as familiar with prophecy as familiar with scripture, we might be skeptical and, and really, and I think it's so important to reach the younger generation, especially on topics like the supernatural, because there's so much content that they are bombarded with that's not from the Bible, but that's dealing with angels, that's dealing with their soul, their spirit, their future destiny and Absolutely. afterlife. And we need to, we as Christians need to engage on these topics, which is part of the reason why I do Thursday Night Theology and why I write on the topics I write on, because Amen. We have to pick up the slack because the world is really delivering, uh, you know, on these topics, but from from a worldly perspective, an ungodly perspective. And we we need to yeah. shine the light of truth to show the Bible has the answers. Amen. I, I, Amen. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more because I'll tell you whether people realize it or not, a lot of fictional media, whether it's Marvel or Disney or or you name it. Um, they're touching on and sort of sneaking in these new supernatural things and almost preparing the world, disguising the, the, the deception that's coming and, and almost conditioning us or, or hardening us to it. And if we can take, uh, we can show people, yes, these things are real. They're in the Bible, but let me show you the other side of it that God warned us about. Instead of thinking, oh, this is great. We're all going to be superheroes like Captain America, you right. know, and uh, what, what are they? Super soldiers. Uh, instead of thinking that would be a great thing. Let's say, well, what about if it genetically manipulated you and you could never be redeemed? You know, that's what the Bible's warning about. So we're trying to show that we're, there's a massive um a satanic plot to uh, deceive people using media and using fictional characters. 
Exactly. Exactly. And, and and speaking of the answers, let's get to the first question. I know people are waiting and waiting. And like I said, I promise Scott and I will also take questions from the chat. I do want to do a couple of housekeeping things, though. Uh, the links to uh, Scott's podcast, uh, the Bible Mysteries podcast, is in the description of this video, um, as well as the link to his website. And so you can find that all in the description of this video. And Lest I be remiss, we, we also will have two winners tonight of a uh, of a special prize tonight. So two live winners in the chat will get a special prize. Well, don't think I forgot that because we're doing a special episode. You So <laughs> stay tuned for that as well. And I will, I will announce the prizes later. But I want to get right into it because I know everyone's waiting. Um, <clears throat> so let's get to the first question. Let me bring it up for you, Scott. And uh, okay. I'm really excited about this because this is something I, that uh, – I think you've been able to delve into in your show that I haven't done as much research into at all. And I think uh, it's going to be, it makes for a really great discussion. And this is Leviathan. So let me just bring mm. up the question. So who or what is Leviathan in the Bible? Is it a monster? And what role does Leviathan play in the end times? And um, I'm going to turn it over to you. But again, just from my perspective, I've gotten many questions and have heard many, many theories and so uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to get into this discussion on Leviathan. So I will uh, turn it over to you. You bet. Well, it's a great question, and it's a it's a true mystery to uncover. So Leviathan uh, is um, is throughout the Scripture, and I believe, like many things in the Bible, there's a there's a one thing that is a type of another thing. So uh, there's obviously symbology that's going on there, but I also believe there was a real creature. Uh, that was designed to be a type of something else. So if we go to the Psalms and we'll start in Psalm 104, I think what we might see is at least at, at first glance, what might be the um, the physical thing that God may have created uh, in Psalm 104, starting about verse 24. O oh Lord, how manifold are thy works and wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So you can see the context is about creation. Verse 25, yeah. so is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. So right off the bat, we think we're looking at the sea as in the ocean on the earth. We're seeing the ships uh, sailing across. And Leviathan is literally almost typified here as a sea monster in a sense. And I, I believe it probably was a, some form of an animal. I don't know that it's a cryptid or what, what some of the shows we're trying to talk about today, but uh, I believe there was something that men could see and relate to. I don't think it was a whale or a crocodile as a lot of concordances try to, to say. And it's interesting the word play there. I, I so often take for granted an English word in the Bible and think, yeah, I know what play means, like, like to play cards or play baseball. But um, I, I have to stop sometimes and, and look up these words in their original meaning. And that word play in Hebrew is, is can be more than one thing. Uh, it could be like to play an instrument. It could be to laugh uh, out of enjoyment, but it could also be laugh mockingly with derision. And, you know, because animals, I don't think they really play in the sense of, well, I don't know about sea animals. I guess otters play and dolphins play. But, you know, this <laughs> yeah. Leviathan makes you wonder, is somebody throwing a ball or are they bouncing a ball on their nose? I don't think that's happening. So I think the play there is is another play on words, with a, no pun intended. Um, yeah. And that is the sea can represent other things, too. The sea can be the ocean. The sea can represent humanity as in the beast rising up out of the sea. And I think this is very much a foreshadowing of that in, in an early sense. And also the starry heavens. And we know that L Satan and his angels occupy a realm of spiritual wickedness in high places. So I think all that ties together. So if we take that, that verse right there to start with an animal of some kind that may or may not exist anymore, but certainly did at one point, and men could see it and relate to it, it's a picture of something far greater. So if we go to Job 41, and that's the real passage, we won't read the entire, uh, um, I, I don't think it would do any good. It would take be here all day, I guess, to read the entire uh, chapter. But it is the chapter of um, Leviathan. And we'll get some description with it. We'll start maybe in chapter 41, verse 1. 
And we read, canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? Again, seeming to imply that this was a real large creature or his tongue with a cord, uh, which thou let us down as if you're not going to fish him out of the ocean. Canst thou put an hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him out of the bird or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle do no more, which seems to imply that you touch him, you're dead, you know. Um, but all of those are really meant to be rhetorical questions. The answer is you can't do any of these things. It's such a powerful creature. And uh, you can go on down to the to the end of the chapter. We won't read everything. But the bottom line is, it says in verse 13 upon er, 33, rather upon earth, there is not his like who is made without fear. He is a king over all the children of pride. So from that point, you can definitely see that whatever this animal was, was a picture of Satan in his arrogance, in his beauty, in his might and power. And yet the best part about this is whatever this animal might have been, he's a picture of something. I believe it is a picture of the seven headed red dragon of the rest of scripture. And we can we can see that as we look at other passages. Why don't we go to uh, Psalm seventy four, or I guess I should say the seventy fourth Psalm, and we see something about plural heads in verse fourteen. Um, actually, let's start in verse ten. Oh God, how long shall the uh, adversary reproach? Um, and the adversary—that's what Satan literally means. Exactly. Uh, shall, Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand, pluck it out of thy bosom? And that's a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the right hand. He is God's right arm and plucked out of his bosom in the sense of he's right now in the third heaven, waiting for the time to return and defeat Leviathan. Uh, verse 12, for God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads, plural again, of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. And I, I know of nothing in scripture where the, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness were fed dragon meat. <laughs> I know they were fed manna, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, so this must be a picture of something else. And I think um, we know that, of course, you did an excellent job in the final Nephilim about painting the picture of Israel in the wilderness, waiting on the Lord, uh, having uh, uh, being protected, so to speak, from the dragon uh, exactly. as he see seeks him when he's cast down. So I believe that's a picture of all this. It's interesting. Uh, Leviathan, uh, Leviathan, I think is how it's said in Hebrew, and I don't. I don't know Hebrew, but it means mourning. Uh, it has to do, or the root of it has to do with mourning. It's like he brings uh, sadness. He turns joy into sadness. It even mentions that back in Job 41. So it's a picture of a serpent who plays in the sea that actually bites Israel, punishes in, in another passage. But we can see he has multiple heads, and I would argue there are seven. And, I think that's uh, a great it, point, by the way. Uh, yeah. I love that, that detail that it says the heads, plural of Leviathan. So I think that's a really good point to connect, of course, to the end times to Revelation. Absolutely. And I think the fact that he's described as what we might call a dragon, uh, or, and it is, they're called dragons right there in Psalm 74. But there's reference in uh, Job 41 to the teeth, the scales, smoke and fire, his niecings, you know, it says to come out. And he has a heart of stone. So you can see there's a picture of maybe God made an animal that was almost, you know, as as mocking in a sense of, of Satan. But it was probably um, he was probably a beautiful creature. We know he was the anointed cherub. But, um, you, you know, Timothy Alberino has a great treatment of, of Leviathan in or well, he didn't use that term necessarily he calls him the dragon in his book Birthright. But he kind of points out the fact that. These seven heads would imply seven rulers, and he believes there might be six additional princes that fell with Lucifer that, that are aligned with him, in league with him. 
And those are the other six heads. And it's kind of interesting that um, uh, if, if the seven heads were like the menorah, the seven candles of the candlestick, it's almost like another attempt of Satan trying to be God. He's the center candlestick. And the other six heads are those other princes that might also be cherubim or something, you know, but they're, they were princes over a realm. It's all, it's all, it's all a demonic mimicry, right? It's a, it's a demonic imitation, satanic imitation. And even if you think about in Revelation 17, when the angel's telling John, I will show you what the seven heads are. Mm -hmm. And he says the beast that was and is not, and yet is, even that is kind of, is a satanic you know, imitation of Christ who was and is and is to come so that, you know, Christ has the title that, that explains his, his eternality that he yeah. exists at all times, past, present and future, you know, w- without end. Whereas the Antichrist being this imitation, this false Messiah has that break. And of course the seven heads, you know, the way I see it is that they, those seven heads coming through time. Those are seven leaders that are throughout biblical history. Yeah. Repeating and repeating. But I love the idea that it even mimics the menorah. Uh, yeah. Or the it, seven it, spirits of God, the seven eyes of the Lord. So it's, it's really, again, this idea that, of trying to replicate Christ. Yeah, and there's another picture of that, too, that that is in a totally unrelated story. But I, I was rereading this the other day and never picked up on this. Remember... In the Bible, in the book of Daniel, when Bel, uh, Bel- I forget Nebuchadnezzar's son's name that, that succeeded him after the throne. Was it Belteshazzar or was that Daniel's uh, Babylonian name? I forget. But whoever he was, it was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And they were um, toasting all their gods in a banquet, remember? And uh, the handwriting in the wall shows up. And he says, yeah. Mene, Mene, Tikal Yefarsin, right? So um, what I didn't realize was they were drinking out of the vessels of the temple that they had raided. Mm -hmm. And it was the menorah that cast the light on the wall when the hand showed up and wrote, it was that candlestick Mm -hmm. that was casting the shadow. And I kind of went, Whoa, I missed that. You know? Yeah. yeah, And so there's another thing of how you had Satan involved in mocking God, so to speak, because he's the king of the children of pride. He's such arrogance that he thinks he can be God. And here he was, you know, using this king of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son to to basically make fun of God and to toast their own gods. And this is how God responded with it, you know. And, exactly. Um, it's really fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. You know, it would take the king of the children of pride to be an imposter who wants and that, to that, try that, to that detail, that that description, I think, is so important. Uh, from Job, because that that takes it from just being a creature to a actual being. That there's going to yeah. be a that it's a, it, that the the creature itself, um, and I agree with your interpretation, uh, was a foreshadow of of a coming king, right? You know, and I think so. Right. I think you know, you know, but looking to Antichrist, the Antichrist kingdom. Yeah, actually, and and you know, there's a. I don't know if I shared this passage or not for you to put up on the, on the screen, but in Amos chapter nine, it was talking, it was God speaking about um, the wicked in Israel. Uh, There's nowhere they could run for it. Yeah. That's, that's it right there. Verse one. Why don't we read Amos nine one? I saw the Lord standing upon the altar and he said, smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away. And he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And, and you know what? Man could climb up to heaven, right? You, you got to think about right. this. And though yeah. they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent and he shall bite them. And I think about that passage, you know, and the whole idea of, is this a picture of how God is using the Assyrian oppressor uh, as the rod of his anger against the wicked? And of course, there's there's an apostate Israel in that time as well, you know, that turns against exactly. the Lord. So we see all these pictures and types there. And then, of course, it finally brings us to the seven headed beast that rises up out of the sea in the book of Revelation. So why don't we go to Revelation 13? And I think what we see in the past is is a picture of what's coming in the future. 
uh, as always. So we finally get to, and, and it's amazing how, you know, the, the images that Daniel dreams about and Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the, the golden image and then the, the four kingdoms and the four beasts all come together in this passage here in Revelation 13, verse 1. Exactly. And I stood, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the, names of, uh, the name of blasphemy. So right there we have a picture of Leviathan, uh, I believe, the, the seven-headed dragon. But then in verse 2, he's a composite of the previous kingdoms. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, which would represent the Grecian Empire. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, representing the Persian Empire. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion, representing the Babylonian Empire. And the dragon, there's Lucifer, there's Leviathan, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads. Well, we know there's seven, right? Uh, wounded, uh, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the word wonder, world wondered after the beast. And I think, Ryan, you've discussed this, too, about the final Nephilim, that the Antichrist is going to imitate the resurrection in a sense. He's going to die at the hand of, of a, evidently a, from a sword. Uh, he's going to take a wound that kills him or seems to kill him. And then when he rises from the dead, that may be one of the very strong delusions that makes the world think, oh, if we're like him, we can't die. We'll have eternal life, you know. And they'll probably take whatever mark he's offering. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So the world ends up worshiping the dragon. And it's interesting to note that of the set, you know, getting back to what you said about the seven heads represent princes throughout history or or some satanic leadership throughout history. Uh, it says that the, the seven heads has 10 horns and it's the horns that have the crowns not the seven heads. So I think we're back to dealing with how Satan, you know, he's an angel or his fallen angels, whatever they are, they're mightier than men. So if they, if there was an actual battle between men and Satan and his angels, we would lose because we're human beings and we're flesh and blood and they're not. So obviously he's limited in what he can do as, as is made clear in the book of Job when he literally attacks Job. Um, and I do believe that's a picture of Israel in tribulation, you know, in type in Job's life as well. But I think that God says you can do this, but no more. You know, he's so the, Satan and the spiritual realm are limited in what they can do. Otherwise, they just come take over. So they must yeah. have to operate through the human proxies because the Bible said in Psalm 115 that God gave the earth to the children of men. You know, there's that's our dominion for good or for ill. It's our dominion. And de the devil may want it back, but he can't just come take it with a mighty hand. He has to work through his human proxies. Hence my term, the satanic global elite, which is one of my favorite subjects to talk about <laughs> in my podcast. <laughs> so the 10 horns are going to be, to me, the, the crowning achievement of the satanic global elite. Probably those 10 Nephilim that you discuss uh, are going to be yeah. 10 global leaders that are ultimately going to give their power to the beast. Yeah, ex exactly. Right. And so and, and this is, uh, I think, the culmination of it. And I think what another thing that just stuck out to me as we're reading through these passages, the idea even of the serpent biting at the heels is judgment. Right. You know, a big part of what I talk about in the final Nephilim is that the Antichrist, right, in Isaiah uh, chapter 10, you know, uh, God calls the Antichrist, the Assyrian, the mm -hmm. rod of my indignation, that he is a tool. God is using the Antichrist to judge the, the unbelieving world and to test Israel to bring them to full reconciliation. And, uh, and then, so, so again, this idea, and so even bringing the serpent up to bite, right. Even that goes back to, you know, to the idea of Genesis three fifteen. that's good, that the bruising of the heel, right. Yes. So they, you shall bruise thy heel. And here is, and we see it early, it says referencing the serpent will come up and bite the heel. So I think, again, it's this, this reinforcement, this, again, this idea of prophecy repeating through time, that God's showing that even it, when it comes down to the great tribulation, that this, the culmination of this Antichrist kingdom and everything that's happening with Satan giving him his authority is all part of God's plan. It's yeah, God is absolutely. Always, always in control of everything until, of course, he completes the prophecy by defeating and uh, Leviathan. So, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I noticed that one of your listeners commented, it's, it's Holonet it, talking about the heads represent the nations. And there's something to that because we know that 
the four composite pieces of this final beast to me represent the, it's like looking back in history. When Daniel dreams of the four beasts, they're, they're ahead of him in time. And now we're looking back at the final beast and it's the culmination of these empires under the final rule of Satan, which I believe is the Roman empire. You know, that was the empire in power when Jesus Christ was born. Uh, that was when darkness uh, uh, was, um, you know, he, he came to bring light to them that were in darkness. And so it's, it's almost like, um, when Jesus started speaking in parables in Matthew 12, it was right after he was accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub. Sure. And he made his statement about blasphemy. And starting in Matthew 13, he began to speak his first parable about the sower and the seed. And right after he did that, the disciples asked him, why, why are you talking in parables? And he said, you know, I kind of grew up hearing people say, oh, he gave he spoke in parables to illustrate the point. But that's not true. He spoke in parables to hide the truth from those who didn't believe. And he says, unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. So blessed are your ears for they hear and on and on. He gave that story and he would always give them Amen. the keys to understanding the parables. Well, if the kingdom of heaven went into mystery form, it would make sense that the great imposter, Satan, would put his kingdom in mystery form. I think the Roman Empire is in mystery form and, and it's about to be... Uh, revived in a sense of, of great spiritual wickedness through the power of this beast, you know, through Leviathan. So that's yep. where, you know, when he mentioned the nations there, I couldn't agree more. There's something about that. I don't know that the, there's seven particular nations, but I think that there's uh, an empire, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's a satanic empire. And I think oh, that absolutely. the 10 Kings might be Kings from 10 nations for all we know, or yeah. 10 regions or something. Yeah, I think it's, I, I see it somewhat like that. Like, you know, we look at Revelation 16, it's clear that there are kings, there are rulers who are coming to meet the Antichrist and the devil. I believe at Megiddo to start preparing the final assault on Jerusalem to battle yeah. the Lord. Uh, but I, I see it as the the Daniel, the miry clay and iron kingdom. I, I see it as the, the fallen angels will play a role in this as well. That there literally will be manifested on earth before the eyes of the people like in the days of Noah. Um, and working in conjunction with the governments of the world. So, yeah. One thing I did want to bring up, uh, I did want to, I did do a little bit of research, a little digging on Leviathan in, in, in anticipation of the show and speaking with you. So, I wanted to bring up one uh, quote I found from a 19th century theologian that I think um, really supports your interpretation, which I think has been excellent, uh, by the way. Thank you. So, yeah, absolutely. So let me just bring this up and I'll share this with, with, with you and the audience. So this is from a book called Primary Truths of Christianity by Robert Norton in 1878. And on this exact question, he wrote that Leviathan in Job 41 is a delineation of Antichrist. And that appears from the words, quote, he is a king over all the children of pride. Also from Isaiah 27, verse 1, where the dragon uh, is twice called Leviathan, and that the dragon that is in the sea, and then quotes it that the behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. And in that day, the Lord, with his soaring great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, I think that really kind of supports your interpretation that. This is the ultimate fulfillment of Leviathan is that, that the, the Leviathan of the Old Testament is just pointing as a foreshadow to Antichrist, the Antichrist kingdom and, and say. Absolutely. In fact, uh, one of the, the passages that I used in my in my podcast when we covered Leviathan was that very scripture, Isaiah 27. And the point that I saw in that that was so telling was not only that he's going to punish the 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 Leviathan, the piercing serpent, the crooked serpent and slay the dragon that is in the sea. So it brings it kind of back full circle. It's Antichrist. It's the dragon at the end times, but it's also that picture that we saw when he was playing in the sea. But the context of the last two verses of 26 is really great because it says in verse 20 of Isaiah 26, come my people. And he's talking about Israel. Enter thou into thy chambers and shut the doors about thee, which I think you used in the final Nephilim about protecting Israel in the wilderness, perhaps in Edom. Uh, hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, 
for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In that day, the Lord with a sword and great sword. And we read the verse you just read. So I think amen. it's a it's a picture of all of this. And it's like, oh, boy, we win in the end. <laughs> the yes. good guys amen. Win. Exactly. Right. You know, that spoiler alert. Right. We win. And I love that passage from Isaiah 26 because I, I, it, it is such a beautiful yeah. prophecy of the great tribulation. Because God is telling his people enter into the chamber. You will be protected. Until yep. the indignation passes over, so the God's judgment is going to is going to pass over the earth. It's, it's going it's to pass over His beloved and punish yep. the unbelieving world. And of course, when you see in that day, I believe that's always a reference to the day of the Lord, the great tribulation. And, and, and I love that you pointed out that it distinguishes between there's the, there's Leviathan, there's the crooked serpent, and the dragon. So it's Christ and Antichrist. You know, amazing to me that 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 you can find in Old Testament scripture this prediction of not just one supernatural heavenly realm being being destroyed, but two mm -hmm. because it's Christ. I'm sorry, it is Antichrist and the devil being destroyed. Obviously, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the crooked serpent and the dragon. The serpent would seem to be the seed. Right. And then the dragon himself yes. is the father of the seed of the serpent. There you go. There, there, there you go. There you go. Great, yeah. great, great stuff. Great, great stuff. Uh, that was that was excellent. I, I think you did a phenomenal job. I, I agree. And for me, selfishly, like I said, I've been waiting to have a good <laughs> Leviathan discussion. So I was really excited uh, personally to have this discussion. So that, that was that was great. So um, I, it's thank you. And there's I know there's more to it. We could dig deeper, but but that's enough to at least lay a foundation for it, it, some of your exactly. listeners to study more deeply exactly and so uh so i know some people are waiting to find out we got to question one um and we're gonna get to another question and we are gonna have definitely have over time and scott and i are gonna bounce live questions off each other and, and i'm gonna take some questions too that have been were submitted during the week uh but i'm gonna repeat the prize from last week so we had two winners last week and two winners again this week you will receive uh a hardcover version copy of the final nephilim so that will be the prize to week an autographed copy if you haven't read it yet uh mm -hmm. i hope you enjoy it uh as i've mentioned a couple of times uh i'm remembering to mention that you can um throughout the book there are qr codes throughout the book that actually provide video commentary so there's bonus video commentary in the book you can scan it with your phone with your tablet and i provide commentary on different chapters different concepts and even a bonus section on the end time Nephilim deception that Scott and I kind of discussed earlier with all the books and movies and pop culture uh, references to the Nephilim from the world that are distorting it and making the Nephilim the heroes uh, yeah. rather than the villains as they are truly in scripture. So that's all there. Also going to uh, throw up the, the trailer now uh, for the audiobook for the Judgment of the Nephilim audiobook. Shout out to Chris Fox. Uh, on Facebook, who asked about the audiobook for Final Nephilim. I'm getting ready to go into the studio uh, right away. So that's coming very soon. But we're going to take a break. I'm going to check some of the comments in the chat and we'll look at the trailer for the Judgment of the Nephilim audiobook right now. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, so you saw some quotes there for the Judgment of the Nephilim audiobook, which actually also has bonus commentary. <laughs> I like to give lots of bonuses, bonus content. That actually also has bonus content that's exclusive to the audiobook. And the final Nephilim audiobook is coming soon. Lord willing, by the end of the month, I have a launch date, but it's going to be here very soon. So stay tuned for that. But let's keep the show moving along. I did forget to mention two things. If you are watching on replay, let me throw up my banner. If you are watching on replay, 
and you have a question, please put it in the comment section of the video, whether you're watching on, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, I do get questions for future shows from the comments from prior shows. So, uh, so you, so feel free to put questions down for future shows. And, uh, of course I will answer them. Also, I want to say, uh, there was a shout out to Scott and on Facebook, uh, one of the Facebook commenters said that they love your show and love listening to you and Zena. So, uh, you got some love. Well, thank you. Facebook page. I appreciate that. I do Very see nice. some names I recognize. So, oh, it's great. It's too. great. <laughs> and and also, I want to encourage everybody. I didn't say it. You know, we love to have great fellowship. So, if you're in the comments, if you're in the chat, share where you're from. You know, so I, some people. I, we had a show where some people. I think it was two or three people were actually from a, from the same town or neighboring town. So. Um, great time to exchange your own ideas and theories on scripture and also have great fellowship. So without further ado, uh, although I do see that Susan uh, said beautiful trailer. Thank you very much. Let's get, let me take down the banner and let's get to our next question. And so this is also from one of, another one of your um uh, you, one, of, one of your shows that was really popular, I know, with your with your audience, and this mm -hmm. is on the Sea of Glass. Let's go to this yeah. question. Here. What is the significance of the Sea of Glass in the book of Revelation? Yeah, that is such a great question. Um, uh, you, you see the Sea of Glass in Revelation chapter four when John is taken up into heaven and a door is opened there. And uh, it's interesting, you know, um, he sees in the throne of heaven some things that are very similar to what Ezekiel described. And I think it's worth noting that the difference between them is Ezekiel looked up uh, from the river Kibar, I think it was, uh, to yeah. see this vision of the cherubim and the Lord on his throne on a, on a crystal, the terrible crystal. And uh, but he was looking up from the vantage point of the earth. And then John is taken up to heaven and he sees and he describes it as a, the sea of glass clears crystal. The difference being Christ had died and, and risen again and made way, made provision for sinful man to gain access to the throne of God. So there's a, there's a type in that alone that's beautiful. But in, uh, in verse one of chapter four, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first a voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was and set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So it's the throne room of God, of God. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow around the about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Uh, and round about the throne were four and 20 seats upon the seats. I saw four and 20 elders sitting. That's a whole topic right there. Clothed oh, yeah. in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne uh, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, here's the verse six. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And he goes on to describe those four beasts later that are the same cherubim that Ezekiel described. So exactly. what we teach, uh, what we taught in the Sea of Glass episodes with the podcast is that when God uh, created heaven and earth in Genesis 1 verse 1, he didn't give the details of how he did that. And to me, Genesis 1 verse 2 is a reconstruction of a divine judgment. Uh, that water and darkness was not, uh, and the earth was about form and void as if God said, okay, in the beginning, God created the earth and here's how he did it. He started with this formless, shapeless mass. Well, I don't think God would have needed to start that way at all. Uh, his way is perfect, the Bible says. So I believe there was a divine judgment upon a world that was, and uh, uh, that's what I think was, was destroyed back then. Satan and his minions definitely corrupted that original creation somehow. And out of that, he brought forth the world that we know now that he gave dominion to man. But before he made man, he took the dry land and he separated the waters above from the waters below. And so what we end up seeing is a lot of versions correct the first verse is in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural in the earth. But I think it should be heaven singular. And here's why. Because in that perfect creation, there was no distinction between heaven and the earth, nor exactly. will there be in the new heaven and the new earth. Because exactly. it says there's no more sea yes. in Revelation 21. 
So I don't think he's talking about that we're not gonna be able to surf or or go wakeboarding <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Right. Yeah, I think yeah, he means yeah. there's no more crystal sea, and that sea is the water uh, uh, above the firmament that separated the first and second heavens from the throne of God because of the tainted creation. You had Lucifer and his angels. There was sin. There was iniquity. There was rebellion before God even made Adam. And then when Adam sinned and brought death upon all men, there's sin on the earth. So both the first heaven, which I would argue is the atmosphere, and the second heaven, which might be the starry heavens, are tainted. The, 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 the creation is not clean before his eyes right now because of sin. Right. But one day it'll be cleansed completely when finally the, the dragon and his angels are thrown into the lake of fire and the Antichrist. And we see that testimony in the book of Job, right? It says that the heavens are unclean in his sight. And yes, his yes. angels, he is charged with folly, right? So it's speaking specifically, Absolutely. it's connecting this corruption of heaven. And I believe, I agree also that there is the sky, there is this the starry heaven, and then, of course, the third heaven being God's domain, the spirit realm heaven. Uh, Absolutely. And that so it, it connects the corruption of the second and first heavens to sins of angels. Right. So, again, absolutely. So again, so again, and of course, you know, Job talks a lot about the the, the, the pre Adamic world. Right. He talks about that. This, the, you know, in Job 38, the sons of God sang and rejoiced at when God laid the foundation of the earth, which, again, goes right. to this idea and provides proof that there was a history that took place prior to the creation of Adam. And I agree that this judgment of the angelic realm, this was an, this is a judgment upon angels, which is what led to the earth being in that tohu vabohu state, this corrupted, formless, and right. state that we find in verse two. And even looking again in, in the book of Isaiah, uh, in, and in Jeremiah, we see that this idea that it says that God did not create the world tohu vabohu. He created in it to be yep. inhabited. He did not create right. it in vain. He created it to be inhabited. So we know that the original created earth was, I'm sure, beautiful, pristine, and then it had to be judged. Um, Absolutely. Which is where we find it in verse two. And uh, you mentioned uh, the world that was, which was in one of the title of one of your podcasts. And so, uh, yeah, that was actually the first episode we ever did. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, you know, through reading your books, I was inspired to. to I'm actually I got a working title of a book I'm working on called "The World That Was." So I hope to explore that angelic civilization, perhaps on the earth before God took it from them, the rebellious angels, and gave dominion of the earth to man. And uh, that's why uh, getting back to this thing about Satan having to work through human proxies, he doesn't have the birthright. Which gets us back to your book about why his seed has to be part human, a Nephilim hybrid, because he, he can't lay claim to the title unless man gives it to him, which that's what the satanic global elite is all about. Uh, buying up all the property so that you'll own nothing and be happy, right? <laughs> In the Great Reset. So that man will finally relinquish all uh, property rights to these leaders that are going to give their birthright, the birthright of the earth to the Antichrist. Right. And, and, you know, and then really, the, when you think about the Antichrist kingdom, it's about total control. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, we, of course, know about the mark of the beast, obviously controlling economics. But if you even think about something that I don't think is talked about enough is the image of the beast, that you have this image that it has to be worshipped. And I believe and I believe the reason why there's an image is because the Antichrist is not omnipresent. He cannot yeah. be everywhere. So he has to have a stand in to be worshipped while he's literally physically doing things waging wars, having meetings. And so he has to have this image. But the right. interesting thing about the image is that it, it is able to know who is worshiping and who is not. And if you're not, you are executed. So again, yeah. you think about that level of control is rarely discussed. That the Antichrist is going to know not just whether you're buying or selling, but if you're actually worshiping, actively right. worshiping or not, which I think is, again, goes to this idea that Ultimately, every it's about the devil wanting to control every aspect of Earth, property, but right. also our lives, our souls, and, I, and and our genetics. Yeah, and I think you may have even touched on this, if unless I'm recalling it incorrectly, that one of the reasons when the angels are cast down to the Earth in the battle in Revelation 12, one of those one of the the occupations of these fallen angels might be to make sure that people are executed if they don't take the mark. They could be it, running exactly. around doing the doing the tattling <laughs> or whatever the administration of of uh, horrible uh, injustices in the name of the antichrist exactly I exactly so uh 
Great. Yeah. So yeah. So um, excellent. Yeah. So the sea of glass, I believe, is the frozen deep. It might be. It might be the face of the deep is frozen. The Bible says in the book of Job, and I think it might be that it's that sea of glass that that uh, that John was standing upon. It's the frozen water that separates the sinful creation from the pure throne of God in the third heaven that that Paul ascended to. Yeah, and of course, after the full reconciliation of everything. After Armageddon, after the final punishment of Satan, there's no no more need for it. As you said, when we get to Revelation 21, there's no need for the sea anymore because now yeah. heaven and earth can now be one again as God. Exactly. And that's that's when you even literally see that the tabernacle of God is with men. The, the new city, Jerusalem, comes down and he dwells with men. They are his God. It's no longer just limited to Israel in their restored time and God being his, uh, their God again, and him being, them being his people. It's at this point, nobody left on the earth, but the saved. And so he's exactly. the God of all men and, uh, and we're all his people, his children. And even, and even just the language of that verse, uh, you know, the, the idea that, you know, that, that I, cause right before that it says, and behold, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, right? It's like a repetition of Genesis one, one, right? And so this is where yeah. uh, a big theme of the final Nephilim is the scroll of time that God is repeating events. To, to pointing to the final fulfillment in the book of Revelation. And so I yeah, truly yeah. see that as just a total repetition of, you know, that's, you know, the the beginning is the end and the end right. is the beginning of the scripture. And, and that's so it's like a scroll where events are cycling over and over again. And the fulfillment of that is at yeah. that point where we have the tabernacle of God with men. Even when the heavens roll together as a scroll. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the listeners, Deborah, is uh, saying it's the firmament. Just say it. I'm, I'm not sure what she's talking about there. I don't believe that the sea of glass is the firmament. I believe it's above the firmament and that the exactly, firmament yeah. would, would be the the the, the starry space. heavens. Yeah, yeah space, right. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. So let's get to uh, we'll go to some of the questions that we got during the week. And then we'll then we'll get to overtime and get to the, the live questions. But I want to get to some of the questions. We had some great questions this week and just kind of both give our take on them. So here's one question here. Um, this is from N and uh, this person asked, does the Antichrist know that he will be the final Antichrist? And could you talk about the rapture, please? <laughs> 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 just just kind of threw that in. in the end. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So does he know he's going to be the Antichrist? I, I believe he would know that he's the Antichrist, the same way Jesus Christ knew he was the son of God. He's going to know it through the, the lies and, and his own fathering. I, I believe he is literally going to be fathered by the dragon. So um, he would know it in the same way that when Jesus was born, he was still born flesh and blood as a man. And he grew up as a baby, but he, he learned about through the word of God, he learned who he was and came to that age when he was 13 years old, found in the temple, questioning the, the scribes and everything. And he said, I wouldn't, you know, I would be in my father's house about my father's business. So he grew to know who he was. And therefore, uh, you know, he was fully God, but he was fully man. So I think um, it's, it's different with the Antichrist. He's not fully God and fully man. He's a hybrid of half human, half fallen angel. So he's going to know who he is through whatever occult practices that he, I believe he's going to learn and be steeped in the, in the secret societies and the, and the, whatever, the Freemasonry, the Illuminati, you name it. He's going to be the pinnacle of the, of the Uberman that Nietzsche wrote of. He, he's, he's going to be the guy that brings us to that next phase of quote unquote human evolution that, that we're all pushing for with AI and genetic manipulation. So I think he's orchestrating every bit of it. And I think he knows who he is. Yeah, absolutely. And you think about it too, is that so much of what he's going to do and it can't be understated is he will have literal supernatural power. It says he can mm -hmm. perform miracles. So again, he's going to be, you know, the highest level of cult practitioner probably to ever live, right? You think yeah. back to the Exodus, right? Jonas and Jambres, the, the sorcerers of Pharaoh during the Exodus who were literally performing supernatural acts. They were not yeah. parlor tricks. And they're going to, you know, and they're, they're going to pale in comparison to what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do. So I, I agree also that he, he is going to be aware of who he is. And just as Christ said that he grew in knowledge, that Jesus in his humanity grew in knowledge. He learned while he was on earth so too will the Antichrist. Yeah. And it even says in the book of Daniel that he will worship a god of fortresses. That, you know, he's going, yeah. he's going to be aware and, to, and actually worship Satan. Of course, ultimately, 
lure the world into worshiping Satan as well. So, yeah, I think he's going to be aware. What he won't be aware of is that he's actually a tool in God's hand. And we see that. And as they attack, right. it, he does not know that he's that God is just using him. That just the he way they think it's not so. <laughs> yeah, they thought they thought that they got Jesus on the cross, that that was it. It was over. They didn't realize that they were fulfilling God's plan. And once again, the Antichrist is going to think he's getting victory, but he's just fulfilling prophecy and loot to, to his own doom and destruction. So, you know, that brings up a great point that you just mentioned, Ryan, because sometimes people ask, uh, and I know you've heard this question. It's fairly frequent about, you know, why does Satan, if he's so smart, think he can defeat God? Right. And and the, the truth of the matter is he can read the Bible and quote scripture better than any of us, probably. But he doesn't believe it and he doesn't have the spirit of God to even understand it. So just because you're intelligent, there's a lot of academicians that don't know the truth. They may be intellectually superior to us in, in what they think they know, but they don't understand the things that are spiritually discerned. That was one of my main motivations in writing Judgment of the Nephilim. So many conversations I had with people who are not believers, where they're challenging the Bible, the two things they bring up out of the gate are the flood and the wars in Canaan. How could you, if you worship this loving God and God is so kind and loving, why would he destroy the human population You know, with the flood? Why would he order women and children to be exterminated? And, and, and why, why does your God bring genocide into the world if he's a loving God, right? Yeah. So these, again, these are people who know the scriptures. They don't believe them. And so, so yeah, so yeah, so the, the knowledge and all head knowledge is is nothing absent the spirit of God, which of course the devil doesn't have. So Absolutely. I agree completely. Amen all right, let's that. get to uh, another question on the on the subject of the. Uh, oh, we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't touch on the rapture at all. I, I don't want to get oh. too into it. Don't get too long into about what is your position on the rapture. We don't think, you well, don't think just briefly because I want to make sure we save time for the for the for the quite the live questions. Absolutely. Well, I would believe that the uh, I believe that we are delivered from the wrath to come. The whole purpose of the rapture, it is the mechanism by which the Lord is going to deliver the church from the coming wrath. The Bible says we're ambassadors for Christ. You don't launch missiles uh, on your enemy nation before you bring your ambassadors home. Right. So uh, we've been saved from wrath. That's what the very term save means. It's from the delivered from the wrath to come. So the the whole purpose of the Lord shall descend uh, with a shout, the voice of the archangel is to call the saints home and get us off this planet because we're holding back the revealing of the man of sin, the, the Antichrist. We have to leave before God can pour his wrath out upon this world. And also because he has one hundred and forty four thousand Jewish men preserved for the very ministry of those final three and a half years with uh, the two witnesses before the Antichrist declares himself to be God and all hell breaks loose. So I think we have to get out of the way. And there's probably a truth in Romans 11 and the olive tree about breaking off the wild branches and grafting back in the natural branches that factors into us being taken out of the way because we're probably no longer any use to the Lord at that yeah. point where we're not doing our job. We're Laodiceans, you know, and he's going to spew us and take us home. So yeah. I absolutely am pre-tribulation on the rapture. I, I agree. I am also a pre-tribulation. I believe that we are point, appointed to salvation, not to wrath. I believe that verse is referring to salvation from the great tribulation judgments, not our salvation from sin. Yeah. Um, and that the wrath is referring to that. And so uh, is referring to the to great tribulation. Um, I know we briefly, we've only briefly discussed the rapture um, before this time, but I, I do believe that everything starts at the sixth seal, that the sixth seal is where at the opening of the sixth seal, that is when the church is raptured to heaven and that the multitude we see in Revelation 7 is the raptured church. It just appears, right? It's in low and I behold. Agree. And that that sudden appearance is because they had just arrived in heaven, brought up from the rapture, and that therefore the seals, the first seals one through five, I believe were opened uh, 2,000 years ago at the ascension. That when, when John be is before the throne of God and sees uh, the, the father holding the scroll and says that no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll in earth or in heaven or under the earth, meaning no one in basically in the universe that that has to be prior to the resurrection and Christ's victory in resurrection. And so I believe that's why in John is sad and then, and weeping. And then it says, and lo and behold, again, there's a sudden appearance that you see the lamb 
as a lamb slain, that the Messiah has now returned to heaven. I believe that's the fulfillment. That is Acts 1, where Jesus is leaving after 50 days after his resurrection to go back to heaven. And now he's appearing and just appears and says he is worthy. He is one victory for us. And so I believe that's when at that moment Jesus took the scroll and opened the first seal. And so I believe those wow. seals are going. And I believe the fifth seal itself is actually the only seal that's really linked to time. Because when the fifth seal is opened, we see the martyrs, the souls of the martyrs under the, the altar. And mm -hmm. they ask God, how long? They specifically want to know, how long, Lord, until you will avenge us? So they're specifically asking, when are you going to judge the earth? And God says, a little while until the number of your fellow brethren is fulfilled. So there's a so so God is, I believe, is saying there's a number of martyrs in the church that will be reached. And once that's reached, then God is going to pour out his judgment, which I believe will be the opening of the sixth seal, which is to come, which begins the great tribulation. Of course, you have the mighty men, the chiefs, the captains saying they now they know. They say, hide us from the face of him that is on the throne and the lamb for the day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand. So that's when there's no mistaking that the great tribulation has begun. Very interesting. Yeah, that's a take I've never explored before. So we're going to have to, uh, I guess you you got another book to write. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Potentially. Yeah. I'll throw out one other thing too to really get you to just, you know, we can, we can talk about this uh, offline. But one other thing I'll say that I, I've never said this on a, on a show, but I believe that even in the Lord's prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I believe that when the verse that says, Lead us not into temptation. I believe that's a reference to the great tribulation. Yeah. I don't believe I don't believe it's it's we're supposed to be praying to God, God, please don't lead me into sinful temptation. God would never right. do that. I believe that's referring to the hour of temptation, which is what Jesus referred to the great tribulation as in Revelation 3. That those who overcome, he will keep them from the hour of temptation that will tempt the entire world, referring to the great tribulation. So I think even in the Lord's prayer. It's pre-tribulation that we're praying to be removed before that hour comes. Yeah. You know, I would have to agree with that because I think there's I, you can even extend that at least to some extent in a spiritual application to first John one nine. Because when John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You know, Paul says we have been forgiven all trespasses. So I'm I'm more inclined to think that John is talking about Israel confessing the sin as the nation, as Daniel did. And the moment Daniel made his confession, that's when the angel appeared and said, I'm here for your, you know, for Absolutely. you. So there's a connection yeah. in that somewhere, because somewhere in Hosea chapter five, God said, I'll return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. And then in Hosea chapter six, it's like Israel answers and says, come, let us return to the Lord. So I think there's something in all that. And it has to Absolutely. do with the two days as a thousand years, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Awesome. A topic awesome. for another subject, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. You know, while we uh, we'll get ready for our next break, I will make some announcements, though. Um, I've mentioned this before that if you uh, that the conferences are back, the date is getting closer. So I will be making my first conference appearance um, in May. So let me throw that up here at the. Homeward Bound Conference is coming in Colorado Springs, Colorado, sponsored by Prophecy Watchers, uh, May 19th to the 22nd. You see here the 25 speakers are going to be there. Um, it's a great roster. Bill Salas, Billy Crone, uh, of course, yours truly, Derek Gilbert, Josh Peck, and many more. Gary Stearman, of course. And that will be, again, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I will be making two presentations at that conference. Also, if you can't travel to conference or you just want two conferences in the same month, there's also the unveiling conference. And this is a virtual conference sponsored by Skywatch TV. And that will be launching May 13th. And again, this is virtual. So you can watch it on your laptop, on your phone, on your tablet, on your TV. And, uh, from the comfort of your home. And I, I don't know how many speakers they're going to be, but I believe there'll be about 20 speakers, um, there. And I'll be making two presentations for that as well. So more to come on that. Very excited to get back to conference season. And I've mentioned the books already. I mentioned the video content. But if you want even more video content, we also have documentaries. There are two documentaries I made for both books. Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, and the final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth. And these are high-level 
overviews of the book. They go through the big concepts uh, of the book. And basically, like I said, if you want to understand the book in a night, get your popcorn ready and <laughs> tune in, watch it, and you'll enjoy it. They both run about an hour each. And again, uh, they're for high level overviews and uh, also good for people who are just new to this content, whether they're Christians or unbelievers and that may not be ready for uh, you know, a lengthy book with tons of research in it. This is a good entree. Uh, and, and even going back to what we talked about earlier, Scott, with your co-host Zena for the younger generation as well, which I'm about millennials, teens, it's a good way, easy to get them into the topic and understanding scripture and prophecy in, with video content. So awesome. I'm going to uh, play the trailer for the study guides and we'll come back. And uh, Scott, you ready for a few minutes of, of overtime? You bet. Let's do it. All right. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. When we look at Genesis 6 from the supernatural perspective, it starts to answer a number of questions we see all throughout the Bible. Why would a loving God send a devastating flood that wiped out the entire global population, only leaving eight people alive? Why did the Pharaoh during the Exodus order all the male children in Israel to be executed? the trailer uh, uh, for Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World. And again, you can find that as well as the books and the study guides. There are also study guides for both books. This is a, the opposite of the DV, of the documentaries. If you want to get deep into the content and really understand the, the, the all the concepts, the etymology, the Hebrew and Greek roots of words, the research, then the study guides are for you. I also mentioned, too, that the documentaries are available in DVD and also in video on demand. Scott, what do you think of that trailer? I love it. Your your production um, is is so good. Um, I'm going to have to find out who's doing your production. <laughs> Brian, but yeah, beautiful combination of the music and the film footage. So um, I, I'm excited, man. I, I, I need to check out this thing. By the way, I think it was a stroke of genius to do the additional uh, bonus content with the QR codes. I just think oh, thank you. Such Thank a delight. It, folks, if you don't haven't taken advantage of that, first of all, get the book. Um, but um, boy, when you scan that code, you get a little video of Ryan discussing a little more detail about that chapter. And it's like he's right there talking to you. So it's really good. <laughs> it was really a, a well thought out thing, Ryan. Thank you for that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. OK, so now for the moment, many people have been waiting for. Let's uh, let's let's bring up some questions. What do you what do you say? You got it. All right, let's see. I want to just um, see what we can find here, and let's get let's get some uh, some overtime. Let's get this overtime started. Okay. And if you see one, feel free to throw one out. I see lots of comments, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to the beginning and see if I can find actual questions. Yeah, if you start at the beginning, I'll read one of the more recent ones. Um, sure. Just real quick, yeah. I see one from Jack. Will Satan actually impregnate a human woman to father the Antichrist or will it be a spiritual inception? I, I believe it's going to be. And Ryan, you you can address this, too, even more uh, with more research you've done. But I do believe it's going to be uh, a, a, a conception as um, as they did in Genesis chapter six. Uh, it, it, it may not be through the actual taking of a wife. It might be through some form of genetic manipulation of the seed. And, and the egg and implanted in a woman could could even be through an abduction type process. But I do believe it's genetic material mixing there. So uh, whether he impregnates it through a Rosemary's baby type thing scenario, I don't know. But um, I, I am, I'm almost inclined to think, Ryan, that 
uh, the human genome is so degenerated from the days of Genesis 6 that we may not be able to just reproduce with an angel as they did. Sin has corrupted us so much. So they may have to do some manipulation, but I'm, I don't have a clear vision of that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that he's that the Antichrist will be literal seed, right? He's the <clears throat> literal offspring um, that could, again, like you said, come from actual relations like in the days of Noah, right? As it was in the days of Noah, of course, that's yeah. it. Easy way to make a link when Jesus pointed to that time when you had that fornication, that illicit relationship taking place. But I do also uh, leave the door open to there being some supernatural means of it happening. You know, again, the, 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 the Lord was conceived supernaturally, but he was literally conceived. He was literally in the womb. Um, so it could be the same for the Antichrist as well. But yeah. but yeah, I think we're but I think we definitely agree that he's the literal seed of the devil. absolutely. Yeah. He he is going to be genetically part fallen angel, part Satan, and part human. There you go. All right. So uh, I, I found a question now. Okay. Uh, first of all, I have to say a uh, uh, quick shout out to Seven Smith because it's the first time I seen the comments. Who said greetings all from China? So thank you for watching wow. from China, Seven Smith. Yes. Yeah, so I uh, appreciate that. And uh, question. Uh, this is from Anna. Uh, who was our winner last week on um, Thursday Night <laughs> uh, She said, question, who or where do you think the city of Babylon is mentioned in Revelation chapter 18? So I'll throw that to you, Scott. Yeah, I uh, I think you and I have briefly discussed this before too, Ryan. But um, uh, I think that uh, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, is apostate Jerusalem. Uh, I don't believe it's Rome or New York or London or, or a literal Babylon in the sense of, you know, Saddam Hussein was trying to rebuild Babylon and that kind of thing. Um, we see so much about um, the, uh, the the fact that in her is the blood of the saints, drunken with the blood of the saints. And Jesus Christ uh, even said that uh, the blood of all the prophets were in her. And Jerusalem. So you've got an Israel of God and a, and a Jerusalem of God, and you've got an apostate Jerusalem. That's the mystery Babylon, in my opinion. It's going to be something's going to take place, uh, possibly after the Ezekiel 39 battle of Gog, where God will deliver Israel in a mighty way from that attack, and they will acknowledge he's their God again, and he will acknowledge they're his people again from that point forward. But um, during that time is when the Antichrist rises to power shortly after that. So he will make Jerusalem be the seat of his authority, just as he wants to be God. He's going to, you know, uh, 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 the abomination that maketh desolate in the temple of God, which will be in Jerusalem. So um, and all of the riches that come to her. And I think you touched on this in your book, Ryan, um, uh, about, uh, you know, the purple and the thigh and wood and the, and the gold and everything. Those are all the trappings of the temple. Uh, from Solomon's day and and even in Moses' uh, tabernacle. So I think that we're everything is pointing to mystery Babylon, and it's actually mystery, comma, Babylon the Great, comma, the mother of harlots and abominations. That is going to be the apostate Antichrist Jerusalem. It, exactly. Uh, I mean, I agree completely. And you're right. I touched on this in the final left lane because I think that the, it has to be in Jerusalem. Like the end time, the focus of the Great Tribulation is Jerusalem, which is why I put Jerusalem on the cover of the book, because I'm really trying to <laughs> right. emphasize that. Um, and yeah, so everything said is correct, right? All, especially, you know, because many times I've seen many commentaries and videos where they talk about the goods that are important to Mystery Babylon. And they just say, oh, it's a metaphor for electronics and luxury cars and fur coats. But no, I think the Bible means exactly what it's saying, that those are specific yeah. materials. And they're all from the temple, like you said, down to the fine wood and even cinnamon. Right? These cinnamon, are very yeah, specific yeah. things for the tabernacle. And even when you look at the name, as, and you're correct, it's mystery, comma, Babylon the Great. That is saying, God is announcing, this is a mystery, and mm -hmm. the name is Babylon the Great. Um, even the fact that it's on her forehead, right? That, that also is, again, is a satanic imitation of the high priest who wore right. on his forehead in all capital letters. You know, if you're King James Bible, they're both in all caps. Um, yeah. holiness to the Lord, right? That he was required to wear that in gold on his forehead. And so even that is, again, showing that this is about the temple. This is about Jerusalem. This is about Israel. And I believe, of course, that's where that is mystery Babylon the Great. 
uh, in the end times, that it will, it will appear to be an, a, a massive revival of Judaism, right? There's going to yeah. be millions of dollars of goods being imported for daily sacrifices in the temple. Of course, at the midpoint, it all comes to an end, but that will be the center of the capital of the Antichrist kingdom, the capital of the world. And one thing to think about, too, that I didn't Absolutely. mention in the book is that I believe that Solomon, when you look at the reign of Solomon, that you see a, a foreshadow of both Christ and Antichrist. Amen. He reigned in peace. He was he had the most prosperous reign of any king of Israel, right, as Christ will. Um, but at the same time, of course, he was the son of David. Um, but also he was an idolater. He erected a uh, an idol in the temple. And also um, when you look at the financial success and this idea that uh, kings and queens from all over the world came to pay homage to him and he had all this money and gold and wealth that you see a both you know, this type of idea, again, like Mystery Babylon, all the wealth, all the merchants wail and cry when Mystery Babylon is destroyed because there was a lot of money <laughs> flowing through the city, just like we saw to the point that in Solomon's kingdom, he was so wealthy that silver no longer even had value. Right. There was so much wealth in the kingdom. So I think, and there's a reference to 666, by the way, in, in this. I was going to say, well. so, the amount of gold that came in in one year was like 6,666 talents. Exactly. So you yeah. get another Antichrist foreshadow. So, yeah. yeah so, sure. And the connection right. to Babylon, the reason that mm -hmm. the mystery is there is because the, the mystery occult religion came from Babylon and it's going to be revised under the reign of the Antichrist in Jerusalem. That's the desolation. That's part of what's going on there is, is the, boy, you, you can get all the way back to, you know, what was Cain and his descendants trying to get after. They wanted that knowledge. They wanted the secret occult wisdom of the angels. And uh, it all ties back into that and the Nephilim. It's really interesting. Yes. Good stuff. All right. Um, Good question. Do you, have a, do you have a question queued up or should I, should I go to one? Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, let's see here. We have, uh, how, this is from Holland. It said, any word on whether the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt? Yeah, there, you know, it seems like every year I hear something in the news about they found the red heifer. <laughs> they found the red heifer, you know. Uh, but, um, you know, I, it does have to be rebuilt. And I would assume in order for the Antichrist to desecrate the temple again, it's going to be rebuilt on the original site. It just seemed, would seem to me that a lot of things have to take place. The foundation stone, um, the, the proper sacrifice uh, mechanisms have to be in place. I do not believe they're going to find the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and it's it's not going to be used. But it's possible that they're going to discover it somewhere. You know, there's a lot of rumors that one of the prophets hid it in Mount Hermon or something like that, or Mount Nebo. Maybe it was Mount Nebo, one of those two. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that they're going to rebuild the temple and it's going to be in the middle of those seven years that they will have reinstituted sacrifices again. And after three and a half years is when the sacrifices are going to cease and he's going to set up the abomination that maketh desolate. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I agree completely. I think that, you know, it, it, and I think even, you know, Daniel 9, uh, which is a very, uh, the prophecy, the 70 weeks prophecy, obviously a very complex prophecy. I think it's really talking about all three temples, I think, are actually referenced in that chapter. And so I think so much of prophecy points to the there has to be a third <laughs> temple. Um, it may not be built this year, but it's certainly coming. And it, mm. it, it, it's, a, it's a critical part of end time Bible prophecy. I so, agree. you know, so I'm going to go back. Um, I don't know if you found any questions in the chat and, and we're going to we're going to get ready to wrap the overtime in a few minutes. If you have any questions now popping in. But there was one question that we received during the week that I actually did not get to. So I'm going to bring that one up now. And this is uh, from Ben. And he wrote, what is the significance of cutting off the head of the Nephilim? For example, David with Goliath, Esau with Nimrod seed of the woman with the seed of the serpent do you uh what are your thoughts on that idea this idea of the those yeah that that's now the one thing that i i know about the david cutting off the head of goliath after he slew him with the sling uh with his own sword by the way <laughs> but i don't remember esau cutting off the head of nimrod i didn't think esau lived in the time of nimrod so i'm yeah. i'm not draw a connection there. Is there that's, something that is from a, that's from an apocryphal text. 
And there's an, uh, I'm trying to remember which apocryphal. It might be the Book of Jasher. I think that has an account that the reason why when when Esau was starving and traded his birthright for the you know the the bowl of pottage or porridge, right. um, that he was he was exhausted from fighting Nimrod. Oh, and so yeah. he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and maybe Esau yeah. was hunting. When, and Esau, okay, and Esau I've not read that. Out, one. But he came home and he was like wiped out, and that's why that's what led to that whole transaction of selling his birthright, or trading his birthright to Jacob. So, so okay. yeah, so that's where that comes from. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that, right. that's where that's from. And and so then the seed of the woman, I guess that that would be a reference to one of the deadly wounds was healed, uh, the wound to the head. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about one of the heads of Leviathan there. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I think <laughs> although that, I don't know how that would. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on it first. I, I mean, I think that okay. that, that really um, the idea, the reason why there are so many head wounds in Scripture, mm -hmm. I think, and even think about Judas, right? He hangs himself, he falls headlong, headlong, and bursts, yeah. right, and hit his head when he hit the ground. Um, Absalom gets caught by his hair and is hanging, right? For, you know, and right. I think also is a foreshadow, kind of an antichrist type figure. Um, right. He wanted to overthrow and slay David. So um, and I think all that, again, is what I call in, in Final Nephilim, I call that quantum repetition. I relate to quantum physics. Right. But this idea, again, that God said from the beginning that the, that the Messiah, the seed of the woman, would bruise or crush the head of the serpent. And so yeah, I believe yeah. God, again, to demonstrate that he is God, will repeat things through time, will use the events of scripture to, again, ripple and foreshadow types of right. prophecy to the ultimate fulfillment, obviously, again, in the book of Revelation. And one thing I also point, I didn't, uh, the one thing that I think is an interesting kind of confirmation of that is when you look at in Genesis in the life of Joseph, when Pharaoh had his dreams of the cows, the seven years of famine, the seven mm -hmm. years of food with the skinny cows and the, and the slim cows and his corn stalks, Joseph says when he hears the dreams, he says he knows it's from God because it's, it was said twice. That the fact that Pharaoh had two dreams was a sign that it was from the true God, Yahweh. And so again, I think, and, and so I think again, that's telling us that God repeats things, and because and the idea is that God uses similitudes; He will repeat it to prove that again He knows the end from the beginning. He's gonna and He's gonna right. show us through time that His plan is intact and is going right to fulfillment. So I think the head wounds are all again foreshadowing to the final. They're all pictures, yeah, man. exactly. Well, that sounds like a better answer than I could have come up with. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, I was I wasn't seeing the connection, but you're right in, in every instance where, you know, uh, was it um, uh, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name for some reason. Um, in the in judges who nailed the spike through the temple. Um, oh, Cicero. Uh, Cicero. Jael. Yeah. Jael. Another yeah. another picture. Exactly. Jael nailed the exactly. And th again, a wound to the head, another picture or type of Antichrist. So yeah. I'm starting to see that connection. Boy, there's a whole other study right there, isn't it? There you go. <laughs> we, got, we got a lot of books to write. <laughs> we do. <laughs> We're going to be busy. <laughs> All right. Man. All right. If, if you found one more, we can do one more question and then we will wrap up. Is there anything else you saw that, you, that caught your eye? Yeah. Let me go back to one that I thought I saw earlier. Um, let me see here. Yeah, it's it's uh, it was from David, and I I like this question. It kind of caught my eye earlier. Uh, did Jesus have blood when he showed up after his resurrection? So, and I'm assuming you mean when he appeared before the the uh, remaining disciples. Um, and you know, it's I, I would argue that he didn't uh, because he's got a resurrected body. And remember, there's doubting Thomas, and he doesn't believe until he thrusts his hands in the nail prints. But he's when when he appeared and they were frightened, um, he said, touch me, handle me for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. And I believe he wasn't just saying that, uh, you know, willy nilly, like, oh, I'm just flesh and bones, you know, um, uh, because we use the term that's commonly to, to say flesh and blood. Uh, but flesh and bone to me alludes back to Ezekiel 37 where you've got the, the dry bones in the valley that come together and the sinews that come upon them. 
and then the skin covers them and God breathes into them his spirit and they stand up on their feet an exceeding great army and it's the whole house of Israel. I believe that's what Jesus was referring to when he was talking to Nicodemus about except a man be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth and thou canst not tell whether it cometh or where it goes. So is also they that are born of the spirit. So I think he was given a, a reference to that resurrection. He is the resurrection and the life. So there would be no need for him to have blood. I can't prove definitively that he doesn't, but I don't know why he would need to have blood in a resurrected body since the Bible says blood is the life and he is the source of eternal life. So I would argue that he probably didn't have blood, but he was very much flesh and bone. And whatever was coursing through his veins was maybe something more divine at that moment. I don't know. We'll have a body like his. I know that much. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I go back and forth on this question. I really do. Because yeah. blood is so important yeah. spiritually to God. It's so important. So it's hard to think, how would you not have blood forever? Because God speaks about blood so often. And so right. in the blood of Christ. Uh, so, yeah, so I, but I, I understand. I agree. It's an interesting reference that he said that Jesus said flesh and bone. And, yeah. not, and, and yeah. some people talk to the fact that say flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So they say see, exactly they have blood. But I will say this. Uh, again, when we look at Ezekiel, the last chapters, 41 to 48, where it talks about the millennial temple mm -hmm. uh, and all the dimensions and instructions for it. There are going to be sacrifices. True. There is there's there are going to be daily sacrifices in the millennial temple, which leads me to believe again there's going to be blood, a significance of blood on the altar in the millennial temple when God when Jesus the Lord is sitting on the throne of David in the temple, blood will still have a significance because there will be daily sacrifices. So again, right. that leads me to believe if if some blood is still important, wouldn't we have it? So but I really, I, I, I am not dogmatic on this question at all. So, oh yeah, very, and I could see it. I could see it both ways because yeah, I definitely, question. yeah, I definitely agree with you. There'll be temple sacrifices in the millennial reign, and I think that has something to do with the fact that um, during that time, men can still reject the truth. You know, mm -hmm. uh, sin is not gone yet. Death is not no, gone no, yet. It's not in a no. thousand years. No, there, so no and, if they there. don't receive the Lord, they're going to have to offer the proper sacrifices. The nations come up for the Feast of Tabernacles each year. I mean, those things are going on. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you're right about that. Now, after that, I'm not sure. You know, when right. you go to the new heaven and the new earth, <laughs> that could be a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Oh, this is this is awesome. This is this is great, Scott. Thank you so much for uh, for you coming bet. on. I appreciate. It. And again, for everybody, uh, you know, you can find the Bible Mysteries podcast. The link to the show in this in the video description, as well as the link to Scott's website. Unlock the Unlock the Bible now. Uh, Scott, do you have uh, any any final things you want to say to the audience before uh, you we uh, get ready to wrap this up? Yeah. So um, so the, the way to find the website is you can obviously do just what Ryan said. The link is there uh, and it's UTB now for short. For those of you that don't remember those other passages. So UTB stands for Unlock the Bible Now. We're going to be working on um, revamping that website in the very near future and introducing an app, an app you can download from the Google Play Store or the App Store, Apple Store, uh, where you'll be able to access all the content as well. So look for that to come up soon. And then um, uh, the next couple of episodes Zena and I are going to do, uh, we'll be releasing the third installment of The Great Reset, because we've been talking about that. And then uh, thanks to something that Ryan taught me in the final Nephilim, we're going to go back and do an episode on Gog and Magog Revisited. So you don't want to miss that because I'm going to literally steal from something Ryan shared with me <laughs> and use it in that episode that just cleared up so much for me and so much confusion there. Uh, and I, you don't want to miss that. It'll be great. And Zena will be there with me. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys. Awesome. Awesome. And also, I didn't mention, uh, also, of course, all of Scott's social media is also in the show description. So his YouTube, his Instagram, his Facebook, it's all there. Like, subscribe. As you can see, uh, you know, uh, he and I are very kindred spirits. He has a strong passion for the word, for getting deep into these topics. So I, I had, I was really excited to have him when I knew this would be a lot of fun. I enjoyed myself. I hope you all did, but I, I definitely had a good time. I did too. This so, was great. Uh, yeah. And, but don't think I forgot. Of course, I'm not going to wrap the show without announcing our winners. So, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> so our first winner, and again, you're going to win a autographed uh, hardcover <laughs> version of the final Nephilim. Uh, it will be sent to you wherever you are in the world. Just send me a DM through any of my social media, through YouTube, through Facebook, through Instagram. 
or just go to my website, gentlemanthenephilim.com. Let me put my banner up. Uh, and you can just send me your information and I will send it to you uh, for free, of course, anywhere in the world. So our first winner, drum roll, today is, yeah, drum roll, please, is <laughs> R.L. Van. R.L. Van, you right. are our first winner. So congratulations. Uh, please let me know your info and hopefully you're still in the room because <laughs> yeah. you won. And you the go. second winner is, oh, this is a great name. The second winner is Carte Blanche. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. Carte Blanche. You have Carte Blanche to get a free book. So uh, congratulations. So again, just uh, send me a DM and you will you will uh, get your prize. So uh, again, thanks to everyone uh, for watching tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're watching a replay, please like, subscribe. All my social media as well is in the video description. And again, uh, hit the notification so you know when the shows are on. I appreciate everyone's time. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you once again to Scott. And be sure to check out his podcast as well. God bless you and Lord willing, see you next Thursday. Take care.